like to come up and, and talk a little bit about the artistic design of each one. Um, because as you know, artistic design is part of what we're here to learn. So Lee's done an amazing, amazing job. Including the frames. Do, do share that. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, there really isn't all that much to it, really. I, it was The thing was art in bloom. And when I think of art, I think of a gallery with frames. And that's how I came up with the idea. And my husband made the frames for me. And then being fall, I figured pumpkins and gourds. And um, the only thing I did is I collected a lot from my yard. Some people brought over stuff. And I went around the neighborhood. They see me in my neighborhood going around, and they volunteer for me stuff. But I bought a lot of stuff, too. But, um, and then, of course, the gourds. The, tr the problem with the gourd is you've got your gourd meaning not your regular pumpkin. You have to figure out how to set it so that it would stay. Now you can cut the bottom to make it uh, flatter, but then you're going to make then it's going to rot sooner. So um, most of them uh, I just arranged the gourd so that it would you know sit there. Then I just hollowed them out. I put some, I put a cup with the oasis in it, the smaller pumpkins, I did that. The larger ones, I just put the oasis in the gourd or the pumpkin and filled it with water, making sure that it didn't leak. And um, then I just used whatever I had. I wasn't, I was just made arrangements. I wasn't thinking of what I should do, or I was thinking mostly of the frame and how I wanted it to look behind the frame. So, um, other than that, I don't what just call it a free, freestyle. It's all freestyle. It's freestyle. It wasn't, you didn't look for a mask or a line design. No. And you did an amazing, amazing job. No. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Do you have a question, Judy? No, I'd, I'd just like to comment on top of what you said. Um, you said you didn't think about the design, but um, we, were, we were talking last meeting about good design, and you can tell that these are good designs. Um, to Lee, it's natural and then internal, and it gets to be, too. I mean, the more you, the more you do it. But there's no question. Um, you know, she didn't make this lopsided. She knew she went one with a nice um, uh, grasses that way. Then, you know, she had something balancing it. So, and the colors, you can really see the contrast. So there's contrast. There's um, so many different colors and, and textures yeah. that um, it's, uh, it makes for a very interesting design. Boy, that bee is enjoying that one. Um, <laughs> I did want to mention that you can see bittersweet in this one, yeah. which for your own uh, is fine, but if you ever enter anything, any reason that um, other people are going going to uh, look at, um, well, I don't even know how to say it, but bittersweet is invasive. Right. So anytime you're going to bring anything anywhere and it's going to be shown or anything, you want to stay away from um, or judged if it's going to be judged it's a no no no, no. Yeah, absolutely yeah not. it's going to be judged yes yeah. it does fit our fall colors i know it's, it's so pretty. pretty it's so pretty it's beautiful that's right well thank you very much thank you thank you ah horticulture jane urso woohoo thank you for The first thing that I want to say is um, I learned so much from Ellen and Karen last year. And um, I know they're not here, but I feel the Garden Club is for any level. Um, some of you I know know all this stuff, but there's many of us that don't. So that's why um, some of the horticulture things might seem simple to you, but yet it's, it's very meaningful to other people. Um, this year, I decided to tie in my art almost every month with my horticulture. So what I'm talking about today is um, called uh, 
bulb lasagna. And I looked up that term and it's taking your bulbs for the spring and um, planting them now in a planter, which many people don't even know that you can do. So um, anyway, I painted this one for you. It's tulips and daffodils, and we're gonna auction it off later. But the first thing I wanna say, it's not deep enough. So um, you really need something deeper than this, but because of COVID, um, I really, couldn't go shopping very far, not no further than job lot. Um, I also bought some bulbs to, um, to, for you to use if you're interested in doing this. So that's my first thing. Okay, the first thing when you're um, planting bulbs in a planter, my first attempt was horrible. They all rotted and that's the most common uh, occurrence uh, with trying to do this. Um, you can't let any water settle in it or freeze in it because then the bulbs will rot. So the first thing is um, get a, a somewhat deep. They suggest, uh, the internet suggests 15 inches or deeper and, um, you know, as large as you want, but it needs to be significant. Uh, let's see. It must have drain holes and the best thing to do is to put shards, broken um, shards from other planters in there. You then want to take um, two parts potting soil to one part perlite. Is that how I pronounce it? Mm -hmm. And that the reason for that is you want to keep your moisture in without it uh, soaking and uh, sitting there. You don't want the water to sit there. Um, so the first thing you do, because they call it lasagna, is you put a layer of your largest bulb. In many cases, it's the tulip or the daffodil. You put those in first, you space them out. Um, you just use common sense. Keep, read the back of the, um, the directions on what you buy, and it tells you how deep it should go. And then you stagger, you put more soil in, and then you stagger the next side uh, bulb and then so on. So you can put two and three layers. Probably the most, uh, let's see. Okay, that's, yep. Then what you do, probably the most important thing is where to put it. I left mine outside thinking, oh, you want it to be cold. So I left it out all winter. It filled with snow, it rotted, it was horrible. So what you wanna do is place it in a cold place, your garage, a shed, um, or a greenhouse because you want the bulbs to be cold. And then water, that's the tough part. Um, you water once a week, if not twice a week, and you don't uh, obviously drown it. You just put in, anytime it feels uh, dry on top, you just water it. So that's the hard part for me anyway, is remembering to water it. And that's it. Then bring it out in the spring when the frost um, is starting to, um, you know, it's starting to warm up, maybe in March to April. And then when you see your other bulbs start to come up, you make sure that you take it out. So um, it's worth it. I, I've seen it done. They are gorgeous in all the nurseries, but um, I'm gonna try it this year and see what happens. So good luck if you attempt to try it. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> okay, on to our program. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. We did get quite a few questions, and they were all good ones. They really were on different topics. So I'm just going to say a couple words about our, our panelists, okay? Because I'm sure you don't know everybody, especially when they're wearing masks. They look a little bit different. So uh, Julie Saunders, she's been a member. I looked up the date for everybody. She's been a member since 2015 and she's been a gardener for many years and her particular interest is, is in keeping color and interest in the gardens all year round which is a feat in itself and uh all right laura laura's been a member you've been a member since 1996 that's a really long time <laughs> a really long time i'm sure some people have been members longer is anybody here Who's been a member longer than 1996? I'm no one? Sure. Wow. Barely. 
Anyway, Laura has her own business designing annual and perennial garden beds and maintaining them, and she has a special interest in container gardening. And now we have Amy, who's been a member since 2016. She works for Willow Bend. She designs and plants their flower beds and planted 200 potted designs just this year for them around their uh, main entrance in their clubhouse. It's another great feat. Fun work. Oh. Really Kathy, I always think of you as KSO. That's right. Anybody else call you KSO? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. does. Yeah. All right. So many Kathy's in the world. Yeah. In my yeah. age group. And not only that, but you have a hyphenated name. Yeah. So KSO is a lot. Dad, I don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Don't hyphenate your name. No. <laughs> She's a certified landscape designer. She owns her, her own business for many years and doing landscape designing and fine garden maintenance and consultation for almost 30 years. Her focus is ecology and our responsibility on being stewards of the earth, which is our thing. All right, and then here's the moderator, our Praz. And I didn't ask her too much about herself. I know that she's a, uh, got a master's degree in landscape architecture from Harvard, and she had her own business for many years. But you are retired, right? I am retired. Com cons consulting only. So I don't have to dig in the, in the dirt for anybody else. We have some very knowledgeable ladies, which is just wonderful. And uh, Sue and Nancy gathered up some great questions that you all presented. And from that, I kind of came up with some categories. And um, with transparency, I chatted with each of our panelists on what I, they thought their strengths and weaknesses were, what they wanted to talk about, and kind of came up with an overall agenda that will hopefully answer all the questions that came in. And if not, we'll get to them at the end. There's always time. And I'm going to start with Ms. Laura Murphy. We had many questions on lawns. Um, you know, they came in, others brought up crabgrass, some brought up a juga in their lawn. Um, others say, we've got a lawn that's mishmash, and I was wondering, Laura, can you just talk about lawns in general and how you see lawns on Cape Cod, what they should look like and be like, given we're a garden club, not a golf course. Well, first off, I'll say I, I don't do a lot with lawns. I'm more um, floral um, in my business, so I kind of took it as a personal way of looking at lawns. Now, um, something that was helpful to me years ago, I heard someone um, talk about a friendly lawn. Has anybody ever heard of a friendly lawn? A friendly lawn allows anything to grow. I would also say it's probably not, quote, a gentleman's lawn that's out there on weekends, not, not to stereotype, but some people really like, like pristine lawns. It's not the case at my house. I have a lot of clover, I have a lot of ajuga, I have crabgrass, I have just about anything that grows there. Until recently, I've had a dog, so I would never want to put anything on my lawn anyway, but my comment is it's a, it's a friendly lawn, and after it's mowed, it's green. And it stays that way, pretty much. I mean, I'm not one that's going to put a lot of water on it, but I do live in the woods, so it's pretty shady. Um, unlike some of my clients. Um, Falmouth had a water ban this year and those people that upheld that ban, they did lose their lawns. But, you know, we were able to hand water gardens which kept them alive. And I'm not sure if you have lawns that um, yourself are burnt out. Most of the time they're going to be um, in the springtime coming about again. Um, I've done, a, I've, I've done some reading and, um, and Sally gave me some information that actually was in the sandpiper for the fall. Um, you know, like where did lawns even come from? And you know, you look back and it was talking about, you know, in Europe, people actually started lawns 
and they were grassed, many different type of grassed areas, mainly for security, so that the people in the castles could see who was going to come to their house. So you can look at that and go, oh, okay. Um, but nowadays we're, we're really trying to think about what people are putting on lawns and the chemicals. And people want to know, how can I get rid of this and how can I get rid of that? Most of the time people are going to Mahoney's or other garden centers to get chemicals or putting on pre-emergence, which means you're going to put chemical on your lawn in the spring and it's going to stop weeds from growing. Um, personally, I have not tried baking soda or vinegar. I understand that can work with some of the um, challenges that we have in lawns if you have to get rid of them. I mean, some people could, if you see, you know, crabgrass coming, the way that it's growing, it could be easy in the very beginning to pull it up. But personally, another way is to overseed something that was, you know, highly recommended is, you know, your clover. I have a lot of clover. And clover is wonderful because clover, you know, attracts our bees. And in the springtime, with all the violets, wild violets on my lawn, that's the first thing that comes up before, you know, the rest of the weeds, I'll say. And that's also there for the bees. So, um, you know, trying to aerate your lawn, trying to get it to be able to take in more water, overseeding it with some of this, they actually call it Dutch clover. Um, or different types of fescues that, you know, can deal with heat. I think that that's the best thing that I could say as far as myself because I am not a lawn person. But another thing is, is if you have areas of your yard that on the sides of it, not doing well, maybe because of shade, maybe you don't need that lawn. So consider reducing the size of your lawn as well. And, um, you know, creeping Charlie and, like I say, the violets and moss in my area, I just, personally, I let it go. So, that's about what I'll say about lawns. I know it's not a technical answer, but I think that we really need to be careful of the environment and stay away from pesticides, because um, it's not helping anybody. I, I can attest to the use of vinegar, uh, just clear vinegar. Okay. Um, one of the questions was, you know, keeping down weeds and tennis courts and cracks without resurfacing. Um, I have refused to resurface my driveway for years, and I just keep a square bottle of vinegar and just go out and vinegar it away, and it, all the weeds just go away. So that has worked very, very well. And you um, use just straight your, vinegar? Just your straight, white, big, distilled vinegar. Um, yes. Okay, because I had researched that as well, and they suggested make, mixing it with soap or like Dawn or whatever, but they talked about like almost like an industrial grade vinegar and then household vinegar. You're just using household vinegar. Yeah. Okay. The big, the big plastic yep. jars on the bottom shelves. Kathy? Just, I want to say something because we're going through a drought right now, <clears throat> and it was shared with me the other day. One of the reasons that they put the Dawn in there is so that it will stick to the leaves. But also, if you're even thinking about doing transplanting or you see that some of one of your plants is really under stress, if you take a bucket of water, say a, a gallon bucket, put in five or six drops of, um, water, of the dish detergent, <coughs> mix it up so it's not suzzy, but mix it up, and put it around your plant. That helps break down the tension in dry soil and will keep those pores open so that when you do water your tree or your shrub, it will keep them open because often people will say, I was just at a client's and they said, but I've been watering all week and you, we went down this far and it was bone dry there, the top was, but so I said, we tried that and it, we did it about a couple weeks ago, well, we tried that and then we went and checked it again and it was able to penetrate deeper. So I, that's w another reason why you should use the so What's the dilution, Kathy? Huh? What's the dilution? I, if you just get a gallon of bu a bucket and maybe put five or six drops in. not It doesn't really? have to be no. heavy, it doesn't okay. have to be sudsy, it just okay. has to be in there because it helps break the tension. I'll add on to that too. How many of you have had hanging baskets and they get so dry and you water it and the water just runs right out? A lot of times the soil has shrunken 
And when you're watering, it's just going down the space that's next to your container. But again, I've been doing that for years. A couple of drops in your watering can, and then water it. And people go, how does that work? I'm like, I don't know, but it does. <laughs> you know, there, there's some chemical reaction that it has. Awesome. But it, it really works because... Do you do that every time you water them? No, I do not. You just nope, like once nope. a month or... Well, Depends. you can tell when you water your plants mm -hmm. if the water is just running away. out. You know, uh, this um, this year it's been so dry. Yeah. Um, many, many times I'm watering every other day. So I'm keeping yeah. the soil moist. But if you don't, we all go through it. A couple of... Uh, drops in the watering can and it will uh, allow the water to go. And it needs, like, does it need to be done or can it? No, I just, any, whatever, okay. whatever. Going right so home. I want to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> Sylvia Wall, Wall uh, uh, shared that with me recently and I thought it was a fabulous idea and it, it really works. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Sylvia. You're welcome. <laughs> huh. A quick thing about uh, clover. I overseed my lawn and a few of you that were at my house last year, Cheryl for one, um, I keep keep a lot of it clover and I use white clover but recently I found a small baby clover seed. Um, I found it at uh, Country Garden. So it's a much smaller clover than your normal whites and yellow clover and I overseeded with that this year and it is so lush and so green. And what I do with my lawn is if there is a beautiful area that's maybe four by four that's got all the beautiful little white flowers and the honeybees are just loving it, then I just make a big patch. I mow everything else and leave that um, so that you get, the bees get the clover. So I've got funky little places all over my lawn. Not necessarily in the front, but in the back area. I have one other thing to just say about clover. Clover is a nitrogen fixer, which is what your lawn needs. And before World War II and all the chemicals, or even World War I, when all the chemicals were developed to defoliate the trees, if you bought a grass seed mix, they always put clover in there. And then after World War II, they said, what do we do with all these chemicals? And they said, ah, we're going to sell the American public on no weeds in your lawn. And that's how clover got to be a nasty. It really is important for the environment because it fixes nitrogen, and that's exactly what grass feeds on big time. So yeah, the Victorians only had clover gardens. They loved it. Yep. It, was, it was the thing. Okay, Laurel, Laura, continuing with you. We talked about earlier that you know you love annuals and planters. Share a little bit about annuals. A couple like pairings you might have. Some annuals you might put in the ground or in planters. Some that you might possibly find drought resistant, though I don't know that there are many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll forget that part of it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm going to start with even just walking out of my post office today. I take care of the post office window boxes in Katrina, and I try and put um, annuals in there that are eye appealing and no maintenance, other than water. And so, um, does anybody know what kufia is? It's an, it's an orange tubular plant. Um, it's like a hummingbird magnet. Mm -hmm. I bought it about six years ago for the first time. If I find something new at one of the nurseries, I usually try and bring it home and I keep it at my house for a year. And then the next year it's everywhere if I like it. Kufia is an incredible they also call it the millionaire, but if you just say Kufia, people would know. C U P H E A. Any nursery, if you go in and say, I want the orange hummingbird plant, it's, it's an get. amazing plant. Orange. It's orange, yeah, and it just comes in orange. I also have uh, wax begonias, and wax begonias are a great plant for sun or shade, and I would say they are somewhat heat tolerant, and there's no maintenance. And they come in red and pink and white, green leaves, red leaves, so you can use them pretty much anywhere. And it's a no maintenance plant. Also, there's scavola if you want something hanging. And scavola, um, probably many of you have used, you know, you can use it in a hanging planter, but you can also put it in the ground and use it as a ground cover. And that comes in white and yellow and bluish purple and pink. 
Um, another favorite um, is ageratum. I do enjoy ageratum. Uh, and I do, um, not to talk about a, a certain company, but Proven Winner does have a really good um, ageratum. Uh, does not need to be um, deadhead as many of the others do, and it is a very prolific plant. Um, and then there's Gomfrina. Gomfrina is a, uh, an annual that does not need to be deadhead, and you can actually cut the bloom. It, it's a ball um, about this big, and it comes in orange or pink, um, white, and <coughs> It actually, I mean, it can get into a small bush. It's a very lovely um, annual. Um, I also like to put in a lot of um, just leaves, uh, just for texture. You know, people, when you're learning how to do uh, arrangements, you're going to hear that word texture a lot in order for things to work. And there's a plant called Persian Shield. And it's a beautiful purple leaf. And it can get tall, but you can also cut it back and it will bush like many plants. Um, and grasses, um, you can go and, you know, in the springtime, there's so many, and I, I'm not gonna name them all, but there's a lot of like four inch or three inch container of grasses. And they really look beautiful in containers with your flowers. And I think one of the, a plant that is pretty much can grow anywhere. Full sun is really hard sometimes, is vinca. The flowering vinca, some people call it periwinkles. But that comes again in white and pink and purple. And it's a very prolific plant. Um, I don't know, there's there's so many of them. Petunias, I like the petunias, the million bells are very small. And then you can have the larger, um, that you do not have to keep them deadhead. But this year, I don't know if any of you had a challenge where they're beautiful one day and literally two days later there's not a bloom on them. Yeah, the and worm. Yeah. there was that bud worm yeah. that came. And I don't know. There's there's other verbena and lantana. Yeah. Lantana is an incredible um, hanging. I'm just, I try and figure out, I don't know if I want to do the petunias again. They're just a little bit too much. So, um, Laura, my, my lantana, I had them in, you know, in big pots that I put in the garage. Yeah. And that the lantana came back. Yep. So I marked them. Uh huh. And they did, and it, I bought new ones, and I have the old ones, and they they did just as well. And so, lantana you know, I comes didn't have in. To buy so many. And they and it comes in a lot of different colors. It's beautiful colors. So, I think I might go um, more with the lantana next year. I mean, I could go on and on and on because I love annuals, and annuals just make gardens look so beautiful, you know, amongst perennials and to fill in spots. So those are all for sun. So then I thought, well, okay, for shade, because a lot of people have shade, myself as well. Uh, I'm not sure how many people know Turinia. Uh, it's T-O-R-E-N-I-A. And, uh, huh? Oh, the monkey flower. Oh, and wishbone flower. There's many names for them. And it's there's no deadheading involved with it. And it comes in the most interesting colors. Um, it can be white and yellow. It can be pink and white. Blue. I had a um, one of my clients, I put a garden in last year that was um, the blue terrenia. And then um, yellow begonias. And it was beautiful, and I mean, just the colors, and it and its shade, you know, less less than half a day. I mean, you know, just a few hours a day. Um, and like I say, there's not the deadheading. So there's also another plant. I'm not sure how many. I'm trying to think of things of different heights. It's called Broelia. Uh, Broelia is generally um, bluish purple, but you can also get it in white. <coughs> And, um, of course, impatience. And, you know, years ago we had the problem with the downy mildew. Myself, personally, I have not had a challenge this year with downy mildew. So that's been good. And then different, different types of ferns for the shade. 
um, a perennial like painted, uh, this is not an annual, but I was just thinking of, in my head, some of the gardens, it's a painted fern. That does really nicely in the shade with these annuals. And caladiums, you all know what caladiums are. So, um, some people have a challenge with things not blooming sometimes, that all of a sudden you've got all this foliage and you want to know where the blooms are. And um, a lot of times it's too much nitrogen and not enough phosphate. I actually have been using, um, it's a miracle Grow product, I think it's called Super Bloom. And uh, the percentage is very high of phosphate, it's 50. And um, it sounds very, very high, but honestly it has done a world of difference with, with annuals and perennials. And I, I don't, it calls for, you know, one tablespoon per gallon. No, two tablespoons per gallon. No, I'm wrong. Our watering cans are two gallons, so I generally would put two in. But once they get going, I only put in one so that it's, it's a consistent feeding every time I water. And then again, also the wax begonias for shade. They're very, very good. So I could go on, but there's other people that want to have really good information to share. So, mm -hmm. um, Laura, the, the last question kind of I had for you was um, switching you over to perennials. And if you had a, you know, a small day lily bed, and I'll probably ask a couple of, of you this question, what would you plant with it? Because day lilies, they have a short life. You can plant them such that you have a nice blooming time, but say late August, there's kind of nothing there. What might you put in with it? Well, sedum, many different kinds of sedum, um, I think looks really nice with them. And um, sedum, I'm not sure how many of you know, but a lot of times in the springtime it comes up really fast. But if you, like in June, end of June, if you literally cut it in half as you would a chrysanthemum, and then it will be coming about more as your lilies are dying back and you get really a much bushier and flowering plant. Yarrow, I think, is also very good. And our fall phlox, because that's a fall flower and I just think it looks really nice in the area. Black-eyed Susans is something else that is about the same time frame. Um, I also like to have annuals in front of the lilies. There's some really nice zinnias. There's a profusion zinnia. And if you think about it, your lilies are growing, you know, the, the zinnias, it's taken longer to, to get up in a, a good sized plant. But by the time it's a good sized plant, your lilies are gone. So it kind of goes well that way. And um, there's a Cleome. I'm not sure how many of you plant Cleome. Everybody used to plant Cleome annual and it was a uh, pretty much a basic one stalk how's that sound and once you had it you had next year 5,000 babies yeah. and you're about ready to go crazy but there's a variety it's called uh, Senorita Rosarita and it is more of a bush Cleome and it does not have a tendency to recede at the rate and that also is something you could put in front of the lilies because you know, it gets, you just have to think of the lilies are coming up and then they're going to bloom and your annuals are getting bigger and bigger and it just works well that way. So that would be my answer for that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Any other questions before we move on? Yes. How many of these uh, recommended uh, annuals are uh, critter resistant? Nothing worse than planting these and then having them eaten. Well, I'll go to the, the experts, but I don't think on the cake you can consider much critter resistant. Because can the bunny How many of these plants would be critter resistant? My answer is there's not much resistant to bunnies, but but I have a, a comment on that, which um, going back to when we were talking about the lawns and having the friendly lawn. 
the more I, clover you plant, the mm -hmm. more they'll stay. Mine, the right. I have hundreds of bunnies. My husband yeah. and I right. love to watch them. They don't touch my flowers. That's correct. No. Because yeah. I have a friendly lawn, and everything yeah. they want is right there in the lawn. Yeah. Perfect answer. Much to my yeah. husband's dismay. He yeah. wants the perfect lawn, but I said, nope, we're not doing it. Good and you. bunnies do not touch them. Yes. Me. I agree. I have to say. I know, and it's funny when you, when you see them and people go, you let them? I'm like, yeah, now watch them. Are they going in my garden? No, no that's no. what you're saying. They're staying in I the lawn. I forgot about clover. that. Mine didn't go in my garden at all this no? year. No, nope. Just right, right ah. to my clover. Mm -hmm. And made my dog go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they also like violets a lot. Oh, yes, yes, they do. Yes, and those are in my lawn. Good girl. Sue. I've grown Cleomis for years, and I've got a, a, a rabbit problem, and they've never touched the Cleomis. And I've had them all in lots of different places. They yeah, have they thorns. So I would say, I'm going yeah. to try that. We always have thorns on them, so that's another reason yes. to stay with but, them. You know, usually the rabbits will try to eat them in the spring. They're hungry because there's not so much to eat, and they'll eat a lot of things they wouldn't normally eat during the summer. But they've never touched the baby Cleomis. <laughs> I'm going to try this Senorita Rosita just because I like the name. Yeah, <laughs> it's a beautiful plant. It's a great plant. It stays plant. short. It stays it short. Stays and, short. And, and and does it come nice. in different colors? No. Yes. There's a pink and a purple, no yeah. white. Yeah. But it, it can get, I have a client right now, I was at her house this morning. It is about this big. Oh, that's big. That's big. Right. I've not seen one. Well, my Cleomies are about five feet tall. Yeah. You know, the, the regular ones. And then, like you said, the next year you've got a 5,000. Yeah. Right. 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 But I do like them for interest because they're, right. they're cool looking. You know what else is also, and it, it and it's overwintered on the Cape, is the, what they call um, <clears throat> the wand flower, Guara, G-U-A-R-A. Agora. G -U -A -R -A. Agora. Agora. Whatever. It's pronounced. Yeah. Agora. Yeah. Yeah. Agora. Yeah. So, um, and that comes in kind of a, a reddish purple and whites and light pinks, and they can get quite tall and bushy, and those are also a nice cover for the... Oh, uh, daylily foliage that has gone by. We haven't got to that for you. Oh, sorry. Hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good one. But Gara is really good. I want to interject this, too, because a really old-fashioned gardener, like in her 80s, when I started working with her, I, you know, you, can, you learn so much from people. And as soon as the Gara came up to be about seven inches, she cut it almost down to the ground. Really? And I'm like, really? And she said, yes. Yeah, I do it every no, that's year. That's a new one for me, too. I, yeah. And it does work. Well, with Gora, I found in the in the fall, what you, it does sell seed fairly significantly. So that if you just take a little bit of the top off of it, where all the little blossoms have passed, um, it keeps it from self-seeding. Right. But don't take it to the ground because then you could lose it. Is it a, okay. Is it an annual? No. Well, it it comes in both. Okay. Well, and it's it self-seeds. Oh, that's sorry. Right. Go ahead. Andy. I was going to say, so when you buy it, I mean, you'll find it for sale in the annual section. Correct. And that won't come back next year, so make sure you buy the perennial version. All right. But okay. But my experience, and depending on where your garden is, right. they have been the annual, but if they're in a protected spot or even not, I mean, if we, we had a very mild winter, right. every single um, guara, guara, whatever you want to call them, in that particular garden, and there was probably about 10 of them, every one came back. Every single one. What you'll find is that the Cape is a very difficult zone because we fall between. Typically around the area we end up in a six, but certain areas you can be a seven A, you can be a six B. So you really have to get to know the areas of your garden as to what's gonna hit what zone. Julie, you talked about how you love perennials and creating a garden that starts in the spring and just keeps blooming and we discussed talking about that a little bit. Well, I, I like perennials because um, they keep coming up year after year and they're, so they're not expensive. You know, I see people going out and spending millions on annuals every year and I tend not to do that. I just try and get a lot of plants. Most of my plant shrubs, ground cover, are all perennials. <clears throat> So I have something of interest, starting in, I'm just going to sort of run quickly through the plants that I do have in my garden. When I started thinking about it, I thought, wow, I really have a lot of flowers, I don't need annuals. And people who go by my garden, they're always saying, why have you got so much in flower? There's nothing in my garden. 
if I buy this plant, will it last all summer? Well, actually it won't. Nothing lasts all summer, or very few things. So you have to sort of plan it <clears throat> to start something and then gradually have things following all the way through the season. So my garden starts in February with snowdrops. I don't know if people have those in their garden, but they are beautiful because they're out in February. They poke up through the snow. They come before crocus. <coughs> Excuse me. Gosh, it's so hot and dry here. I should drink something. And then I have Scylla, and then I have all my spring bulbs, daffodils, tulips, and I always make sure when I look at a new daffodil or one I want to buy, <coughs> that um, whether it says late season, mid season or early season. So I, I, it's very important, people tend to look at daffodils and think, oh gosh I'd love that one. And then they don't look at the bottom and see whether it's an early bulb, mid season bulb or late bulb. So that is quite important when you're planning your colour and how long you want it to last because it's all, it lasts a really long time, maybe three months, if you make sure you have some of everything. And also, Lily of the Valley, that's very early. A lot of people say, oh, it's horribly invasive, I don't want that. But I just love the scent of it, and I love to pick a bunch and bring it indoors. And then comes Hellebores. I don't know if people are familiar with those. I'm sure some of you are. Um, they last a really long time. They come in pink and mauve. They're similar to um, the Lenten Rose, but I've still got that foliage in my garden you know, since the spring, so it's very hardy. And then the next thing to come up is um, <coughs> columbines. I don't know if people are familiar with those. They come in all different colours, pink, mauve, white, purple, and they're very, they'll, they'll spread rapidly everywhere. In fact, you'll probably have to pull plants up. But they are pretty and they're a good height and so they, they intermingle well. And then along with the columbines come bluebells, which you get English or Spanish varieties which you can buy. And the difference between the two types is that English bluebells have all the flowers on one side of the stem. Spanish bluebells, they have them on both sides or all sides. So that's how to tell the difference between those. They'll last, they come out at the same time and last about the same time. <coughs> and then along comes um, Solomon Seal, which I love. Um, that also can spread quite readily. But I think it is a wonderful, graceful plant. And you can cut five or six stems and bring them in the house and they have a lovely scent to them. The little white flowers that are on them are actually edible. So a friend told me and I actually tasted a couple and they taste like fresh peas and so that's an interesting thing about those and then I have um, may apple which probably not that many people are familiar with it's a ground cover but and I would say probably invasive but it is a native plant and I think it is um, isn't that an invasive plant it can be because it yeah. goes underground but it but it's um, a beautiful leaf and underneath you can just watch and a little apple will form about that big. Um, it's an interesting plant but you have to pull it up if it becomes too invasive. And then after the May apple or the creeping phlox is coming out, everybody must know what that goes very nice on rock walls and will come up every year very very hardy. And after that comes irises, Everybody's got those in their garden, I'm sure. Very regular. Some of them are repeating bloom now. So if you, that's a good one to choose. I think the more, um, the newer versions are repeat bloom, which is good. And then another thing that I have a lot of, because it's very hardy, is Crane's Bill, which is a hardy geranium. And you can plop that in everywhere and it will fill in all the spaces. My idea is to fill in all the spaces so that I don't have to weed. <laughs> and this comes in sort of purple and white and pink. And then along comes peonies, which are absolutely beautiful, um, but very short-lived. You can guarantee that once the blooms come out, 
we get a rainstorm. Yes. And they're all there. Yes. <laughs> but they are gorgeous to have, and there's so, so, so many varieties of those. And then one of the tried but true ones that um, Laura also mentioned is sedum, which comes in many varieties. Most people are probably familiar with the one that grows about this tall. Comes up in the early spring, is pale green to begin with the flower heads, and then it goes to pink, and then it goes to brown. And it lasts right through fall. It, it's, you know, something to have in your garden. And in the summer garden, catnip. I love it, and I have it in many places because it's the wonderful thing about it is that it's bushy, little blue flowers. Of course, cats in your neighborhood probably like it, but um, it, you can cut it back when it's stopped flowering and it'll come again now because it, I have it out in the garden now. Um, so that's cat mint. And then daylilies. Um, I don't plant them en masse because. The problem, as we've mentioned, is that when the flowers go, you're left with a lot of sort of ratty looking leaves which don't really have much interest. So I concentrate on beautiful daylilies that are more expensive but I like to look at. Usually of a sort of peach ruffled variety or a pinky variety. And I have those interspersed with my other plants. So I don't really have the problem of a bunch of leaves looking miserable. Um, and the other thing I have in the garden, which is up in the summer, foxgloves, which I love, particularly white ones, and they also come in, the common one is mauve colored. Also hollyhocks, which are good because they're tall, and they come in peach and white and maroon. They're a little difficult to grow, and they're actually biennials. So if you buy one at a nursery, um, expect it to come back the next year, you probably won't get it, but you might get it the year after. And another good one, a still be, everybody's familiar with that. It's a good filler of spaces, it's very pretty and lacy, and even looks nice when it's dry. And also, another thing I have, Japanese anemones, they're tall, they come in pink and white, and they come after the first flush of um, summer flowers. And of course, the thing in beginning fall that I have lots and lots of are tall flocks, which come in white, purple, pink, striated, and they are very, very hardy and will come back every year. Now, a lot of people tell me that their flocks gets mildew, and I always say, oh, well, mine never do. I've never had, never had it on my flocks. Of course, this year, I got it on my flocks the first time, but I think it's probably because it's been so hot and humid, which sort of encourages mould. And then in the fall, we've got the Montauk daisies coming along. And besides all those flowers, and I'd be happy to give anybody a list of these things which come sporadically um, through the season, if you want one. But another thing that I have tons of is ground cover. Epimedium, which comes in, has a little um, pink flower or yellow flower in the spring which is very delicate and gorgeous. It looks like a little miniature orchid. And then you've got the ground cover of the leaves, which are quite pretty in themselves. And the other thing that I have a lot of, which I inherited with the house, was Pakisandra, which fills in a lot of space and um, will stay green, and actually come up with little white flowers in the season. And the other ground cover which I love is um, Chinese ginger, which is very pretty. It looks like little tiny, um, water lily leaves, that's really pretty. And sweet wood rough, as every, anybody who's got that in their garden will know that they can't get rid of it because it's everywhere. But in actual fact, it is a pretty leaf and it does have a little white flower. And then the other thing to boost all these flowers are roses. And I'm going to tell you all to put in Rambler, Drift, Rugosa, or Knockout just because these are the most likely to survive in gardens in New England. And of course you can get all cut flowers, all colors. Rugosas are particularly rugged. They're sort of, well, they're not native to us. They're actually native from China. But people think of them as the rose to have on the cake because they're everywhere. Um, so you've got those. I've got roses in bloom right now. And um, the other rose that you should not 
not consider are those little tiny miniatures that you get at the supermarket. Yeah. You see them all the time, little tiny ones. Mm -hmm. Buy one of those, give it as a gift or buy it for your counter or whatever, and then put it in the garden. I have one that is 35 years old and it's still coming up. A dear little tiny pink rose. Um, and then besides the roses, um, good fillers and texture, Put in ferns, they're beautiful, they're long-lived, they're very graceful and very pretty. And costas and grasses. They're, and I have a lovely fern called cinnamon fern, which you're probably familiar with. It has a big, long spike, sort of cinnamon color. And it has about three spikes of that. And that lasts all through summer and, you know, it's out of my garden now. And of course, the other thing that is perennial, which I shouldn't not mention, are perennial shrubs because of course they come up every year and a lot of them are very pretty flowering i.e. viburnum, enchianthus, dogwood, carolina spicebush, rhododendrons, azaleas and bubblia all of which I have in my garden and they supplement the colour through the season. So that's about, that's about what I do with um, my perennials and I really don't need to buy any I don't really have room for annuals because I have all these perennials coming up. Um, I also try and think about things for the fall and um, chrysanthemums in my garden are not really very good at repeat blooming from year to year. It's almost like an annual thing. I have had some that come up but most of the time even though they say hardy chrysanthemum they're really not hardy. But I try to grow grasses and things that are of interest in the fall. And I just brought um, these with me, which you're probably familiar with, but you might not be. This is a, um, a teasel, which is very nice for against snow in the, in, in the winter. And it's a beautiful plant that comes up and can get up to six feet high. And it comes out with little mauve flowers, and then it dries to this with bracts, which would probably be nice um, if you sprayed it gold for, in the, in, for the Christmas season. And the other thing that I have only this year managed to get to come up in my garden are Chinese lanterns, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Very, very, very. But I love these. I think they're gorgeous for fall arrangements. And I, I, I actually did buy the plants for these, and they didn't do anything for about three years. And then suddenly this year they came up and put them in groves. And the other thing that I love, which a lot of people don't have, is this um, oat grass, which I, I got the seeds from North Carolina when I was down there at the beach, and they were all growing along the beach. And they're probably considered invasive, but I think they're very pretty. And these also, you can spray gold for Christmas decoration, you know, which is, which is pretty. Now this teasel thing, you probably will not find it here in the States, because I actually bought the seeds in a seed packet from England. And I'm sort of hiding under the cover of it being a seed packet that I bought, as opposed to an invasive, which it might be, um, in England. Because it does grow in the hedgerows along wheat fields and so on. But I think it's a very pretty thing. And uh, I'm thrilled to have it in my garden, as is Cheryl. <laughs> is this your first year? Um, actually, started them from seed last year. The plant came up, yeah. but no teasel. This year, the plant came up, and they had teasels. I, I have one in my yard that's probably 25 years old, and every year it comes up. You know, it might be a little bit different. Yeah. But um, I would many award at Barnesville County Fair because it's one of the most beautiful flowers. It kind of is a circular around the outside. Yes, it's pale, teeny, pale tiny, yes. purple. It comes up just, green and then yeah, pale mauve. It's mode. so beautiful. Yeah, it is. And yeah. the bees absolutely yeah. love it. What's it, Julie, what's it called again? It's called Teasel. Teasel. T-E-A-S-E-L. Thank you. Laura York would always talk about it being a very um, important plant in the Victorians because that's all women had to use for brushes. Uh -huh.
Well, yes, that, and Cheryl found that out for me yeah. too, that yeah. these, you can, you know, brush wool sweaters and it'll get rid of um, little bubbles. I grew up in western Pennsylvania and we used to cut them. They grew everywhere. Oh, did fields, they? Fields there. And we used to cut them and leave the stem about this long and then put them in a styrofoam form um, for Christmas tree and oh, then that spray, would be yes. spray it, you know, yeah. uh, whatever color you want I actually don't have that gold. many of them. I, I promised Alda some and Nancy <laughs> some. And, uh, Cheryl's already got some. Uh, I will be getting them to you sometime. But they're, they're an interesting thing to have. Um, so that's about all I can say about perennials. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good list of perennials. Did I hear echinacea in there? Actually, I forgot about that because I had it. That's what I thought. Echinacea is another the other really thing, good one. The other thing that is wonderful, which I forgot on my list, um, and which I love, is uh, ladies' bantle. Oh, yeah. 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 So I, I really have an awful lot of plants. We'll need to like take that. it and categorize some for shade. Sun and, and it's a nice little list. Yes. It's beautifully done. Thank you. Amy. Your oh. turn. You're <laughs> up. <laughs> okay. Um, they asked me to speak today to start out by talking about how I got into gardening, which was pretty simple. Um, Twenty years ago, I bought two little tiny window boxes at Christmas tree shop and filled them with pansies because it was the first thing I saw in the spring. And um, that was a pain in the neck because yeah. the, that was a pain in the neck because the pansies dried out and the boxes dried out. Anyway, every year I have tried more and more, and the one thing that I've learned with gardening, as all of you probably know, is that you learn from your failures. Um, and then I decided to start taking some classes, and I've taken a plant and soil science class. So they asked me today to speak about soil. Um, I don't, it's kind of boring, so I'll try to keep it kind of short and to the point. Um, it's so important. It is. It's, mm -hmm. it's the most important thing. If, if your flowers aren't doing well, the first place to look is in the soil. Um, there is, there's so, in, the, in one teaspoon, one teaspoon of soil, there are billions of things going on that you, you just, it's, um, if you like that kind of chemistry, I can recommend a few books to read, but otherwise it's kind of boring, but it's amazing what's going on. You've got all these microbes with bacteria and fungi, and they all work together, and it's amazing what's going on. Um, so what I do want to tell you, though, about feeding your gardens, feeding your soil, is to use an organic compost, whether you buy it bulk, or whether you buy it in a bag because you have a small garden bed. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, give this to your roses and this to this plant and buy this supplement. But how do you know if you need that supplement if you don't know what your soil is doing? So it's very easy. We've talked about this many times in Garden Club about getting a soil test done. Um, it's really easy. You go to the UMass website, just do a search for soil test. Um, and that can tell you if you have any deficiencies. But most people don't even want to do that much. You just kind of want to be able to generally feed your garden bed so that everything's going to be as happy as it can be. And the best way to do that is to put down an organic compost. Um, you can get it delivered in bulk. You can get it by the bag. That is going to, and you don't have to, old school was you're supposed to work it into the soil. Now they're saying, nope, you just place it on top and let Mother Nature and Rain, which we didn't have this year, <laughs> do its work and it'll get, it'll get all those nutrients into the soil to feed the plants. Um, that's where your plant eats, is down there in the soil, so that's the most important part to keep happening. Compost, compost, compost. Then, I hi also highly recommend mulching, um, because mulching is going to help keep the moisture in and the weeds out. Um, please do not buy or use colored mulches. No black mulch, no red mulch. They do that for a reason. The, the stuff that they use to make the black mulch and the red mulch, they dye it because it's probably not what you're supposed to be using for mulch. It's not the good wood chips. 
they may have pallets mixed in there, they may have rubber mixed in there, and that's why they dye it and sell it to you at a cheap price. So just go with the plain, plain old compost, I mean mulch that hasn't been dyed. Um, those are going to be the two most important things you can do to, for good soil health and then you probably won't need to have a soil test and you'll find that your flowers are coming up and I do do extra um, fertilizer in my pots with my animals because I want that they have a very short time frame to live so I want them to kaboom with as many flowers as possible um, if you if, if you have a chance to like compost on your own or even if you don't want to get into it that much um, even if you bag up your leaves if you have a corner of the yard you can put them in to make leaf mold because um, the leaves are like the number one thing in compost yeah. and you can just you don't even have to buy special bags use a plastic trash bag fill it with leaves take a pitchfork poke holes in it both sides if you get a shed you can stack them behind let them sit there you want the holes in them so the worms can get in so the rain can get in I've started doing this a couple of years ago. It takes about, sometimes I, it'll get done in a season, a year tops, and you've got this beautiful compost looking leaf mold that is gold dust on your soil. You just spread it around in the garden bed. That way you don't even need to put the compost down. The leaf mold will work fine. You put the mulch over it to keep the moisture and you're good to go. Can I add to that, Amy? Yeah, I recently, um, I've been trying to find a company that sells leaf mulch ever since we went to Sherborne and to the, the house that Sally Zekai talked about. Um, and, and we went to, and that whole garden was all leaf mulch. Mm -hmm. yep. And there's a place up in Sherborne area that was the leaf mulch. So I've been trying to get a company that would make it. I said, you would have a bonanza. Yep. So I figured out how to do it on my own. Maybe it's a good way. Another way is to break up your leaves, besides just mowing them in your lawn and letting them stay there. Right. But if they're in some of your beds and it's oak leaves, which need to be mushed down a little bit, Put them in a, in a trash bin, like a trash can. I have a metal one. I have those two. Make sure there's holes in the bottom. I don't even do that. You don't? No. But I use my old plastic one. Well, I put it, I fill it about, you know, a third to halfway through, and I take my weed whacker. Oh. And I weed whack it in the thing, and then I dump it into my wheelbarrow. I add just a little bit of composted manure or a little bit of enriching mulch, and it's right on the garden. And I just keep filling it up and weed whacking. I also have a battery operated weed whacker, which you know, saves time as well. <laughs> but it's a great, great way to mm -hmm. use your leaves and to put it back on your lawn. Mother Nature doesn't fertilize. Right. That's the right. leaves fall and the leaves are full of so many nutrients, exactly what the root system needs. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep your leaves, find a way to do it, it's, it's the best thing. Mm -hmm. um, keeping in mind also, I mean I do that where I grind them up. At the same time, if you've got an area where you can just let them sit in a pile, all the insects that lay their eggs that are on those leaves that they know are going to fall to the ground and so that they can hatch in the spring, because that's what feeds our birds. You know, we need to do that in my outdoor shower. I yes. all the leaves in. And leave exactly. So it's also so many to find a place to not crumble some. Um, also wanted me to, to oh and then also um, tilling was something I wanted to touch on so tilling from everything I've been reading and listening to in the last couple of years tilling has become an old-school thing they say you really don't need to till like even with the compost you put it on top um, when you're planting a new perennial you can add a little bit of organic matter in there but not too much you don't want to plant that plant in a hole that you filled with beautiful organic compost because then those root systems aren't gonna go beyond that hotel right there. They don't want anything to do with that bad soil on the other side. So you've gotta keep, when you plant something, you wanna make sure that you, it's in that original soil system and then you put compost on top. And that compost is gonna feed down into the root system to get it to grow. Um, so back to the tilling. Um, tilling actually can be bad, it depends on the garden bed. What tilling up, I mean, if you've got a hard area that you've got to do it, you've got to do it. But for the most part, you don't have to do it. What tilling does do is it turns over wheat seeds that are down below that aren't growing because they need sun. Well, now you've just tilled the wheat seeds to the top and they can grow. So just a word of warning on tilling. Um, 
a lot of this also applies to raised garden beds. Um, with raised garden beds, again, if you just keep going to keep adding compost, you make because the um, soil in garden beds can settle over the winter as it, you know rain and snow get on it can settle. That's perfect to put your compost in. If it is too hard, take a pitchfork and turn it a little bit, and then put your new organic um, matter on top for planting it. And you even want to mulch your um, raised garden beds. That'll keep the weeds out. Um, that'll keep the moisture in. I don't know if you've ever been to that phenomenal daylily farm off Cape, I want to say it's uh, uh, a tranquil, tranquil, tranquil Lake Nursery. Oh my gosh, it is overwhelming the first time you go there. The beauty is amazing. Their peak time is around third and fourth week of July. Bring a picnic lunch to sit under the willow bend tree while they dig up the flowers that you've ordered. Um, and what I like is that they have everything so that you can buy June bloomers, July bloomers, August bloomers. And I've even got one client that's got, um, she's got daylilies blooming right now. Beautiful peachy ones. Okay. Um, Next one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so where do we start with invasives? Well, I think Cape Cod, Massachusetts has um, more than its share than other areas. Um, uh, we have a lot of wild areas, sandy areas, uh, and we, you know, a lot of invasives love those as well as woods. So I um, went to the U, um, University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension has a really great um, article it came out in 2009 but all of this information is still really relevant and I'm just going to talk about some of the things that they talked about and alternatives to those things um, and then I'm going to touch on some things that are very specific to us like porcelain berry which is horribly invasive um, swallow wart which is another horrible terrible thing which because it um, fools the monarch butterflies it's similar to um, our native uh, milkweed species and um, the monarch is totally dependent to feed, lay their eggs and have their larva feed on the leaves of um, the milkweed. So the swallow wart has pretty much the same composite and it it, uh, chemicals and things that attract the monarchs except that their leaves are poisonous to the babies. So, um, and it's very similar, it's, it, it's a vine, it crawls in up into chain link fences. It has little slim pods as opposed to our milkweed that has pods that go up to the side. It does blue, It does bust its pods a little bit earlier um, than our natives, but it's a totally different stru plant structure than our natives. If you see any growing in any highway byway or if, you'd be walk if you should be walking around that have not had their pods Split and you can't pull them out, grab the pods, throw them in a plastic bag, throw them in the trash. Um, because they're very um, viable and um, it is a real problem down the cave. So um, I just, and we have in the past in our newsletter had some information about this particular invasive. Um, if you want to know, to know more specifically about things, just put Swallow Ward in any uh, Google search and um, it will tell you a million um, reasons why you don't want it around and also ways to get rid of it. It's almost impossible to get rid of because if a tiny bit of the root is left in the ground, it will come back. But if you keep the pods done, at least the population will stay restricted. Um, so burning bush, everybody loves burning bush. It's beautiful this time of the year, but even look around here, we have beautiful sassafras gives you some fall color, reds, <laughs> oranges, and yellows. Um, native blueberry bushes also turn red. Um, choke cherries, also another native. And I want to talk about native alternatives to some of these introduced species, which came to this country and have been touted for many years as wonderful, easy to grow ornamental plants for your garden. And they are easy to grow, and that's one of the reasons they become invasive, because they self-seed, they're very viable, they can live in lots of different kinds of soils and climates, um, and they can outcompete our natives. So they come up a little bit earlier, their leaves come out a little bit earlier, they shade out the natives. Um, and, um, and, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, about uh, our little rabbits and deer and other um, critters that like 
wood trucks, they, they're not interested in those. They will go after our natives first. So our native plants and shrubs and flowers have a lot of pressures on them right now. Not to mention um, the weather conditions that we've had over the last XDX years. So in addition to um, the blueberry and the choke cherry, viburnums are lovely uh, alternatives to burning bush. Unfortunately, um, we have a bug now, we're talking about invasive other things, insects, um, called uh, the viburnum beetle. Um, that if you sometimes, if you have any viburnums, you can see it looks like, like almost buckshot has been uh, shot into the leaves. It's all holy and very lacy. And that's the adult beetle uh, feeding on the plant. And then it will go to the very tips of the branches lay its eggs in the very tips of them, they overwinter in the plant, and then they hatch in the spring to then continue the cycle. One way to get rid of them is to, early in March, before it blooms, the leaves come out, cut the tips off. And you can tell that the tips have been in, uh, have the eggs developing because they're a little bit fatter than the other tips of the branches. Um, but, and there are many different kinds of viburnum. Some are tall, some are short. They have beautiful fall color, reds, sometimes um, oranges, uh, and berries that the birds like. So it is a, it is a native, and I will encourage people um, to, to use natives as much as possible. Another plant is barberry, Japanese barberry. Another thing that was planted like crazy in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, uh, you know, tough, hardy plant, don't have to worry about replacing it every year. Well, it's berries, the birds love, they eat it, they uh, distribute it through the woodlands and uh, open spaces and our yards, and I just read something interesting this summer that places, fields in western Massachusetts that are infested with barberry, like wall-to-wall -wall barberry, the tick population in those places, because it's so shaded by the leaves, is 20% more than in other um, areas. So because it's cool and moist underneath these very dense branched leaf plants, um, tick populations are pretty high. So, um, so the suggestions for things that you might put in there is a wajilia. Wajilia comes in with green leaves, wajilia comes with purple leaves. Um, so you can, it will be interesting uh, in the garden. Um, there's some that come really low. There's some that are much bigger uh, shrub-like plants. Um, Dutzia is another. It's got a pretty little white flower. They have tiny ones that cascade that are beautiful, but then they also have, again, good size, medium-sized shrub-type varieties that you can fill in a, a bigger space if you need to. One of my favorites in Sally's, too, is the, it's called uh, Nine Bark. Um, there's a wonderful variety called Diablo that has really deep purple leaves. It's multi-stemmed. Um, <clears throat> it's got really pretty little flowers, and it does color up um, in um, the fall time. There's one called Summer Wine, too, that's a little bit finer in texture um, and more compact. Um, it has got really pretty bark as well, so when the leaves are gone, that's a, a really good, good choice. And as I said, it does have nice fall color, coppery, orange um, for the for the green variety, and even the red. What about light? Um, that can take, it likes full sun as much as possible. Um, but I have one um, in my yard that is not the darker leafed one, and it does okay with morning sun and respite from the afternoon. Um, the purple leaf ones plants really mostly in this a particular plant like the full sun if you put them in the shade you're going to lose that really nice deep vibrant color so better for the the colored foliage to put that as much as possible in the sun um, it's also very densely branched um, so it's a really good place for the birds to hang out uh, even in the winter time when there are no leaves on it gives them a little bit of protection from their predators etc um, and shrub roses are also a nice some of the roses um, have lovely fall color on them, as well as the bloom all through um, its season. Um, one thing, again, thinking about uh, invasives, multi 
uh, multiflora roses, which have the really pretty little hips that grow like huge and um, the birds again love and disperse uh, in the woods um, and they're quite invasive and sometimes some of the the roses that you buy in the nurseries that are extremely hardy are grafted onto the multiflora rose stuff and be sure it, it is not. If you buy roses that are grafted, that is not the multiflora stock because the multiflora will also then branch out from its, its uh, root stock. So um, you do not want to plant multiflora roses. Um, other shrubs besides um, the things that I've mentioned, Clethra is really a very pretty plant. It grows in wet areas, but it's very adaptable to drier locations. That turns a beautiful yellow uh, in the fall. It blooms in July. The little bottle brush flowers, the bees love them, and the scent will pick you up and move you across the yard. They are beautiful. It's not a Chloe scent. It's just, just a beautiful, <coughs> soft, um, fragrant uh, shrub. Hence its name of Summer Sweet. That's right, mm -hmm. Summer Sweet. But it can be, it, you, you gotta give it room because it roots under and yes. pops up yes. everywhere. Yes, so, so that's a good point, Sally, thanks. It is one of the underground spreaders. So it's a great place to put maybe on a little bit of a slight of an incline where you might have erosion or something where you want it to be stabilized and this thing will stabilize for you. Um, what else? One of our natives that I love is the um, bayberry. Um, that also is very pretty. The birds like the, um, the, the fruits of it. Um, and if you're really industrious and you can collect the berries, you can make your own candles. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, Just make sure you're not picking the poison ivy berries. Right, yeah, be careful if they're not the poison ivy berries. You want to make sure you get the blue ones. Um, another thing that I have been using more frequently now and another runner is called Low Grow Fragrant Sumac and that gets fiery red it, and it stays pretty low. It's got a really pretty uh, lobed leaf um, and so that's another alternative if you're looking for the beautiful fall color. A lot of people used to plant Norway maples. I hope people aren't doing that very much anymore. Um, they uh, self-seed like crazy and again it's one another one of those things that shade out a lot of the natives um, so for um, alternatives for that there's a beautiful northern red oak called Corcus rubum and um, it is a slow grower but once it gets established it's gorgeous um, ginkgo trees get huge so you'll want some place that has uh, a lot of space for those but they date back to before dinosaur times. They've been on this earth for a really, really long time. And they're quite beautiful trees and they have lovely, lovely fall color. And the neat thing, a, a little quirky thing that the ginkgo does is after it turns this beautiful array of yellow fall leaves, every single leaf drops at the same time. Yeah. Boom. So you could go to bed and have a tree that's full of beautiful yellow foliage and in the morning it will all be on the ground. So that also helps with the raking, so that you don't have to do it 10 days in a row. You just get everything done in one, in one day. Um, and then another good, nice, perhaps, uh, you now starting to get overused street tree in, in place of the Norway maple is the Japanese tree lilac, which is gorgeous. It has these big cone-shaped white flowers, um, and it is quite a substantial, beautiful, stately tree. Um, some of our crab apples have really pretty dark foliage. Um, and uh, flowering plums. Thundercloud is one of my favorite. It's got purple leaves, and then when it's in bloom, it is uh, pink, pinkish white flowers, and it's like a cloud. It really does look like a thundercloud, and that's, that is a beauty. That gets to be about, I don't know, 15 to 20 feet tall. Excellent. So I will, I, like I said, I'll send all that stuff. Okay. okay. Excellent. There are a couple of questions that I want to get to that were not addressed, uh, and they related to pruning questions. Uh, so very quickly, and we'll try and cover this topic more, but when we talk about fall pruning, I always suggest kind of waiting until March. But there are a few things that will help you to not have to weed a lot. 
for instance, your Rose of Sharon, your hibiscus, perennial hibiscus. You've got all those beautiful little seed pods where the flowers are. Feel free to pull them off before they pop open and spread. Or even with a Rose of Sharon, you can cut it back six inches or so and just say goodbye and keep it, keep it tight in. Hydrangeas do not prune in the fall. However, if you've got hydrangeas that are brown, take them off very close to where they've parted if you want to get rid of the actual bloom. But if you go down a little bit more, you'll see now where the next blooms have already started to come in because they form their buds now to bloom in the spring. So do not cut them off, but you can lightly deadhead for sure. Except for the PG hydrangeas, the paniculatas, and also the Annabelles. You can almost cut the Annabelles to the ground, but your paniculatas, you can prune beautifully in November or so and get those ready for the next year. And a Caryoptis. I love Caryoptis, one of my favorite shrubs. Beautiful blooming this time of year. Um, I find they can self seed. So you can gently take off the old flower beds, buds at the end. But don't prune it hard because it's a, it's a shrub that can get a lot of winter kill. So you don't want to cut it heavily until the spring. And that's about it, ladies.